Next up, Andy Caress. Yes. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a trigger warning, maybe, because we're going to talk about suicide stigma and conversation. So I'm just going to say that before. Um, and he's a mental health trainer for schools and young people at Charlie Waller uh, Memorial Trust. Uh, thank you so, so much. Okay. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, good morning. Thank you so, so much for having me. Uh, my name is Andy Caress. I'm a mental health trainer at Charlie Waller Memorial Trust. I'll uh, give you a little bit of background to the trust. It was set up by the Waller family about 20 years ago. Um, their son was a young man in his mid-twenties and on the surface he looked like he had everything going for him. You know, he had a job, he had a, a graduate degree, he had a girlfriend, he had a flat, he had a supportive family. Uh, unfortunately Charlie developed depression and you know, we're already hearing about the impact depression can have. And unfortunately at the age of 28 Charlie took his own life. So the trust was set up to do exactly this. We want to raise awareness, reduce stigma, get people talking, get people feeling more comfortable. When I first planned this talk, it was meant to be about suicide prevention. Um, so that's what's in your booklets. Um, in the last two weeks, a school that I've been working with in Cardiff had the death of a, a student by suicide. And so they've been dealing with the ramifications of that and the ripple effect that that has had on their student body, on the teachers, on the parents. And as you can imagine, it has devastated the community. So rather than focus on prevention, I'm going to talk about an area of reducing suicide deaths that perhaps we don't think about because we don't want to, that of suicide postvention. And I don't know if that's a term that we're familiar with? No. So there are three strands to reducing deaths by suicide. Prevention, those positive steps we take to offer young people alternatives, to give them hope, to give them options, to give them those supportive relationships. We have intervention, that direct action that in rare occasions people must take. And then there's postvention, the steps we take following a suicide to support those left behind, those bereaved. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to acknowledge that someone in our life might even be feeling these feelings, let alone think about what on earth would we do if this was to happen. But it's something we do need to think about because we are leaving ourselves desperately unprepared. There was this, a recent study by the University of Manchester and they looked at 922 young people over a two-year period who had taken their own life. And they found that one in nine of them had recently been bereaved by suicide themselves. It is a huge risk. Going through such a traumatic experience and not getting the right support can leave our young people exposed and vulnerable. And this is where we can come in. This is where we can use our developed frontal cortex brains to support the young people in our care. And that's, I want to give you some practical guidance on, on how to do this and how to prepare yourself. So nothing will truly prepare you, of course, but we need to do something. Figures from Papyrus, which is a suicide prevention charity, show that in the UK every year, 200 school children take their own lives. That's four per week. We need to do something. So what do we do? Our first temptation is to lie. If we have to share this experience, if we have to tell a young person that someone in their lives has taken their own lives, our first temptation is to lie, to say well, it was an accident or, or that something happened and we're not sure what and to kind of sh sh to sh save them from the embarrassment, the humiliation, the, the stigma, as I said, that still sort of exists around mental health. But we live in a world where communication exists on all levels, where young people can find out information at the drop of a hat. And I would never, ever want a child or a young person in our care to find out something like this that's not from someone they trust and someone they love. You do not want to damage that relationship. So this is where suicide postvention comes in, positive steps that we can take to prepare for what a, sui a survivor of suicide described as grief with the sound turned up. Because there's going to be a huge, huge outpouring of emotions, of grief, of anger, of guilt, of questions that are never ever going to be answered and this is where we can come in as caring loving adults so let's look at the mob one guilt if someone's left behind if someone's bereaved by suicide there is a huge amount of guilt why didn't i spot the signs should i have done more should i have helped could i have noticed why didn't they come to me why didn't they feel comfortable if you're talking about a child was it something i did did this person, was it my fault that they were unhappy? 
we've got to be there for them. We've got to reassure them that, yes, maybe that person was unhappy, that there was something in their lives that they weren't happy about, that there was issues and concerns, but it was not their fault. But the only person responsible for a death by suicide is the person who takes that decision. That you are there for them, that you are not going anywhere, that you love them, that they are blameless, and that they are going to feel these feelings, that it's okay to feel these feelings, but if they ever have those kind of feelings themselves, that they should talk. We need to make ourselves aware of the support that's out there and share it with our young people. Whether you work in a school, in a youth group, whether you're a parent, it's so, so vital that we take the steps. So let's look at anger. Of course you're going to be angry. A person in your life has made this decision, has taken themselves away from you. That is going to create a huge amount of anger. How can they do this to me? Why have they left me like this? They obviously didn't care. You will be feeling anger yourselves. Of course you will. It's a devastating, devastating thing to occur. That anger can be at themselves, linked to that guilt that we talked about. That anger can be at you, at the person sharing it, or at the person who has left them. It can be at someone who they feel is to blame in some way. Anger is normal. Anger is a stage of grief. But the reason we need to manage it is because we need to look after that young person's well-being. Anger can become internalised, self-harm, self-neglect, self-damage. It can become externalised, taking risks, hurting themselves or hurting others, lashing out. We need to manage that emotion, ride that wave with them to guide them through it. If you're feeling anger, role model that anger. <coughs> How do you manage it? How do you cope? How do you move on? The third stage is this loss of hope. If you see someone who has taken that option, who you can empathise with, identify with, whether it's a friend, a family member, a celebrity idol, if you see that they've chosen this way, that can make you feel, well, what's the point? Anyone who's ever been bereaved in any way will know that feeling of, I don't know how I can move on from this. If it's by suicide, this will amplify these feelings inordinately. And this is why the suicide risk increases, and this is why we need to manage it. It can be contagious, and we need to be prepared. We need to educate our children about the support that's out there whether it's papyrus, whether it's Childline, whether it's teachers, police officers, family members, friends, whether it's speaking to someone from Cruz Bereavement, whoever is out there, whatever <coughs> source of support they need, make it available, educate them, and be with them and support them and guide them. I'm very aware, and I can see the mood in the room is it's quite a heavy mood, and it's a heavy subject, and I do understand that. And I hope... <sighs> Ten minutes is such an inadequate time to cover this subject, and... I'm more than happy to stay around at lunchtime and, and not talk and answer questions, direct you kind of other sources of support. There's something called the um, Support After Suicide Partnership who has some fantastic resources, some leaflets, booklets. If you work in a school, if you work with young people, look at Papyrus as a, as a website. They have a school safer suicide policy that you can adopt. On our website, we have a mental health policy for schools. We need to be open, we need to talk, we need to address it. Silence is the biggest killer of young people in the UK and we need to change that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing, very insightful and very important. Any questions, please, regarding this? Thank you. Yeah, just want to say thank you. Um, I lost my dad to suicide when I was younger and went on to like have a whole range of problems with it myself, like a relationship with it. Do you, do you feel like we need more um, personal stories within schools? Because um, I was actually told by my teacher to probably keep it a secret as to how my dad died. Um, and then we never spoke about it. I never ever heard any personal experience throughout school. Do you feel like it's something that should happen or, or that it's too triggering? What, what would be your opinion? I think that's an excellent question. And certainly, you know, this will be my opinion. And it's certainly not kind of the, the opinion. But it's a hard balance because we do not want to stigmatise those feelings. I don't want 
people to feel so embarrassed and ashamed of having those kind of feelings that they don't feel comfortable talking. The message that we should always be pushing, and if you're going to include these stories, if you're going to talk about it within a school, within a youth organisation, is to focus on the hope and the help. Focus on the impact that a death by suicide has and turn it into a positive. I think there's a temptation amongst schools to, if they're going to do a memorial, for example, it almost turns into a shrine and you hold this person who's died by suicide up as a kind of, this image of, they're, you know, they're in heaven now and they're wonderful and, and you know, they're at peace. And that can be quite confusing and quite alluring to a young person who might be struggling. So if someone is going through that, I would want to be talking as openly as the, as the young person involved feels comfortable, guided by people with the knowledge and the experience to, to support with that, but hammering home this message that the feelings might be normal, but that should never lead to someone taking that choice, that it should always lead to someone seeking support. Does that kind of answer the question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. There's two points, really. Um, with regards to um, the suicidal impact um, on a child, um, could be a parent, um, is it advisable or not um, to ask the child directly whether that child has a plan? Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. And, and the other one is, well, the other point is, um, in terms of experienced bereavement, is it the case, because you mentioned the, the seven cycles of bereavement, but you only mentioned some, will a child experience all or just some? That's an excellent question. If I focus on the first one first, um, so this is more on the suicide prevention, that asking the direct question. Just a, a quick show of hands. If you were concerned about a child, a young person, a friend, a family member, would you ask the direct question of whether they've been having those thoughts? Yeah. Would anyone be afraid to? There is a fear to it. Absolutely there is a fear. And it's very easy for me to stand here and say, don't be worried. But I will say this. You are not going to put the idea in a young person's head or in anyone's head. It does not work like that. That if you say, have you ever thought about taking your own life, that a young person will go, do you know what, I hadn't. But that's a cracking idea. <laughs> and I say that really flippantly, and I hope you take it in the spirit that it's meant. If that young person is having those feelings, then they'll have been having those feelings. And if we pussyfoot it around it, and have you ever, you know, thought about doing something really... You wouldn't do anything silly, would you? Because what's the child going to say to that? No, 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 I'm not going to worry you. No, 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 don't worry. We block ourselves as a source of support because I don't want to worry mummy, I don't want to worry daddy, or I don't want to worry my teacher. Whereas by saying, look, I just want to check. Have you ever thought about taking your own life? Have you ever had suicidal thoughts? Yeah, I have actually. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Let's move on, let's work with it. In terms of those stages of grief, it's... It's not something I'm, I'm as knowledgeable, I, I'll be completely honest. Um, and I think grief is a very individual process and I think the way it manifests itself is very individual. And I think my main point is, however it comes out and whether it takes days, weeks, years, we need to be with that person to ride that wave with them and support them through it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Cheers, thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, what, so thinking about, um, you know, this idea that connection is really important, okay, what are your thoughts about how to proactively get people to connect around a subject that tends to come as a bolt out of the blue, um, to prepare people without suggesting that it's a good idea, yes. if you like? There's a fantastic YouTube video that I've watched a number of times, and it's called, oh, I'm going to have to get this right, I think it's called In the Grey Area of Feeling Suicidal. You can try and search it, it may not be exactly that. But it's a, it's a voice over a young woman, she's saying, I'm suicidal, but I don't want to die. I'm safe, I'm okay, and I'm here, but these thoughts are there. Suicidal thoughts occur on a spectrum. From has you, you all had that feeling, I'm sure, of I wonder what it would be like if I wasn't here. Well, it just wouldn't matter really. Or when you're growing up, just I used to daydream about my own funeral. I think that makes me quite morbid, but I used to just imagine all the people gathering round. 
we need to be aware of what risks we are. The reason we ask, have you got a plan, is because we need to know. Just, yeah, do you know what, sometimes I have those thoughts, but I can shake them off and I can move on and I can get on with my day. Through to, do you know what, when those thoughts happen, I'm under the covers and I can't move for a week. We need to understand that those are a part of growing up. Adolescence is a key risk time for this because of all the changes that are happening in the brain. To understand those thoughts are normal, those feelings are a part of our development, but what do we do with those thoughts? Teaching our children emotional literacy has got to be part. Do we have any teachers in the room? Do you teach mental health in PSE or in tutor time or circle time or whatever? Fearful eyes. Well, we've even moved out of teaching to do just that. <laughs> Fantastic. Which is so wonderful. I love coming to things like this because you meet so many wonderful people who are doing wonderful things. I know that's such an adequate question, but I'm very aware of time. But You're good, thank I'm you. I'm good. Yeah. That, that's good. One more? Yeah. It's just, just a comment on the suicide. Uh, we are trained to ask the question as you've described, but also ask what are the protective factors? What prevented you from carrying it out? And it might be, I couldn't do this to my mom or my dad. Um, and so it's very important to get that child to actually explain the reasons why they didn't carry it out, because that's the protective factor and that's your strength, that's the resilience. I need to build that. Absolutely. And the key point of that is to get it to come from that person themselves. There's a real temptation that we almost end up guilt tripping people. What would your mother say? What would your family think? What would you do? And actually that's trying to put ourselves in, in the shoes of someone who, whose experiences we can't. When I, I mean, the reason I do this job is because I have suicidal thoughts. I live with depression, anxiety, and I've reached crisis point and I've reached a point where I became convinced that the best thing for my friends, for my family, for my wife, was if I wasn't here anymore. And the person who asked the question that brought me back from the edge was exactly that. It was, well, what, what would keep you from following through? And that, and it came from me, and I stopped, and I sat, and I thought about my nan, I thought about my wife, and that was enough just to just almost shake me out for that moment. And that got me through the next minute. It didn't fix everything. It didn't get rid of those feelings, but it got me through that crisis point. So it's so key to, to, to get thinking about those resilience factors, protective factors as well. So thank you, Denton, for sharing that. Thank you, thank you very, very much for listening.